OK, so thank you very much. We're going to move straight on to hearing some, some actual direct studies. All of the evidence I just presented was compiled from a whole series of studies. But now we're going to hear, I'm delighted uh, to move on to two presentations which will be sharing real voices of, of lived experience. And uh, to start this, we've got uh, Professor Jason Halford. Uh, welcome, Jason. It's fantastic to have you with us, who is head of the School of Psychology at the University of Leeds, the president of the European Association of Obesity and former chair of the UK Association for the Study of Obesity. He's a member of the European Coalition of People Living with Obesity and is lead of the Action Teen Study, which looked at the experience of adolescents living with obesity globally. So I'm really looking forward to hearing some of the findings of your study. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karina. It's lovely to be here, and I really should send in shorter biographies. Uh, <clears throat> now, I'm delighted to talk to you about the Action Teen Study, which is a recent study that I have been involved with. Now, the reason the Action Teen Study is really important is we know that uh, adolescent childhood onset obesity is associated with worse outcomes than adult onset obesity. And we know that adolescents with metabolic syndrome and overweight are more likely as adults to have increased risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular problems. But it's the bit on the right, as a psychologist, which really concerns me. Obesity is associated with substantial mental health burden for children and adolescents, and increased comorbidity of depression, anxiety, and low self-esteem. Now, we know there is a bi-directional relationship between uh, depression and obesity. If you have obesity, you're more likely to have depression later on. If you have depression, you're more likely to have obesity later on. And that relationship is starts from the age seven. So it's great, Karina, I think you, with the Millennium Cohort Study, what we know from the age of seven is either BMI or internalisation starts predicting the other moving forward. And interestingly, that relationship is mediated by social economic status. So it's important. The SES bit, the inequalities bit, is really important in the relationship between obesity and mental health. Now, the Action Teen study was the first study to explore the barriers to effective obesity care on an international scale. And it looked at it from adolescents living with obesity. We had about 5,000. Their caregivers, we had about 5,000 of those. And healthcare practitioners. And the study was funded by Novo Nordisk, a company with an interest in obesity care. Now, where was it? Well, there was 10 participating countries. In the Americas, we had Mexico and Colombia. Uh, we had South Korea, Taiwan, Australia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Spain, Italy, and also the UK. And actually, the UK had the most ethnically diverse sample and probably one of the samples with the greater inequalities. Unfortunately, I won't be able to share the UK data, but I will say the picture is much worse in the UK than any of these other countries. Really, really shocking. So I'm going to talk a little bit about information sources and where do people get their information about weight management. Well, if you have a teenager, you will know the amount of time they spend on devices uh, and actually trying to extract a device off a teenager, which was the battle that I had last night after my wife gave up and just said, it's your child. And you will know how tough this is. They, they, they love the thing. So where are they getting their information about obesity and also their information about weight management? Well, adolescents with obesity, living with obesity are getting their information predominantly from YouTube, social media, and to a lesser extent, family and friends. So we're talking really about influencers. And if you've seen anything about influencers and the sort of influencers uh, that uh, uh, adolescents living with obesity are looking towards for guidance and advice, you'd be a bit worried. Now, when you do these studies, it's really typical, difficult because if you, on the internet, look for this information, they know that you're a middle-aged man, so they're trying to sell you sports gear, OK, uh, to, to try and reinvent your youth. If my wife goes on, they try and sell a washing powder, OK? But when Zavi goes on, my little lad, he sees a completely different universe pitched at him. So it's really difficult to get a handle on, that, on what's going on out there, but I doubt it's particularly good. What... Uh, caregivers look for? Well, they actually go to a doctor 
then they go to search engines, and then they go to YouTube. The search engine is an interesting one. It's Dr. Google. And so you really need to be really, really careful about the information uh, uh, caregivers are getting. I might add in the UK, uh, the, health, the healthcare practitioner comes much lower down the caregivers list, OK? And there seems to be a real break in the UK between the caregivers and the HCPs, which really needs addressing. Of course, the HCPs internationally, CME programmes, conferences, journals, that's where they should be going. That's great. We asked the three groups for their perspective on did you perceive obesity to have a strong or a very strong impact on overall health and on well-being? And 72% of our adolescents living with obesity believed it did have a strong or very strong impact on both overall health and well-being. Slightly less with the caregivers, and that might be because a, a, a lack of awareness of the childhood, child's weight status. They may look the same size as the friends in many of these communities. And also, there's a bit of wishful thinking, possibly, on the part of parents. A bit of puppy fat. Uh, healthcare practitioners, 89%, which in my first view of it, I thought was really good. And then I thought, actually, who are these 11% who don't think that obesity has a strong or very strong impact on overall health or well-being? Little bit concerning that. OK, so let's look at perception of current weight and overall health. Now, these were all adolescents living with obesity. Through their self-reported height and weight uh, were either obesity class 1, 2 or 3. Now, 76% of them uh, perceived their weight was above normal. Uh, not necessarily that they were living with obesity, but above normal. That was greater than their caregivers. Their caregivers, again, was only 66%, which is, you know, two-thirds are getting it, but there's a third who are not perceiving their child's weight as above normal. Now, that is an issue. Again, there is kind of a bit, might be a bit, oh, this is a bit puppy fat again. There might be this, well, they're not all that different from their friends. Uh, so that might be playing in here. But what we did see in terms of adolescents' overall health, adolescents still felt positive generally about their overall health. 71% felt positive. Uh, either it was uh, good, very good, or excellent. And that was greater, again, in the caregivers. So we can see this caregiver adolescent slight disparity in the data. And you can see it ringing through on other data points. Now, in terms of attitudes towards weight loss, there was a lot of consistency here between the caregivers and the adolescents living with obesity. I could lose my weight if I set my mind to it. My child could lose weight if I set their mind to it. I'm highly motivated to lose weight. My child is highly motivated to lose weight. If I lost weight, I could keep it off. If my child lost weight, they could keep it off. But look at that one. Now, this really alarms me, this data point. My weight loss is completely my responsibility. 65% of adolescents living with obesity think their weight loss is entirely their responsibility. And given we know the biological etiology of obesity, and given we know the impact of the food environment to exploit that, that is really worrying, because these individuals are trying, struggling to manage their own weight without proper advice, going to the internet, and they're destined not to succeed. And think about the mental health impact of repeated failure and what that does to self-esteem and self-confidence. And importantly, also self-efficacy. Now, in terms of weight loss attempts, Unsurprisingly, over the past year, 58% of adolescents living with obesity had spent more time, uh, spent uh, repeatedly times trying to attempt to lose weight. That was slightly underestimated by their caregivers. Not surprising. Adolescents tend to hide things, uh, so we wouldn't be surprised about that. In terms of future attempts, 74% were going to attempt another weight loss attempt uh, in the next six months. That compares with... Estimations of their caregivers, again, only 63% of their caregivers thought they were going to do that. Again, caregivers may not be uh, completely tuned to the weight struggles and weight loss attempts of adolescents living with obesity. Now, in terms of motivators for adolescents living with obesity, for their weight loss, to manage their obesity, they wanted, by and large, 
to be fitter, in better shape. That was really important to them. They were also unhappy about their weight, and they really wanted to deal with that unhappiness. And they wanted to feel more confident about themselves, feel better about themselves, OK? So that's why they want to primarily <coughs> lose weight. What did the healthcare practitioners think? Well, wanting to look like their peers, improve social life, social interactions, popularity. That is a really superficial view of the motivations of adolescents living with obesity. And if you are going to have a successful therapeutic interaction with somebody as a healthcare practitioner, you really do need to understand the person sitting in front of you. Now, I don't want to blame healthcare practitioners because how many healthcare practitioners get trained in obesity? Very few. How many healthcare practitioners get trained in dealing with adolescents? Is that part of a medical degree? What they did get right was they did perceive that the adolescents living with obesity wanted to feel more confident, wanted to improve their self-esteem. And that is a starting point for a therapeutic interaction. So at least we've got that. Now, in terms of barriers to adolescents living with obesity, what were their barriers for weight loss? And this is, again, another ranking. Well, the top one was not being able to control my hunger. And if we know a lot about the biology of obesity, we know that many people living with obesity have weakened within meal satiation and a weaker post-meal uh, satiety response. So food isn't doing what it should do. Food should satisfy appetite. It is not in the same way that for normal people with a normal weight. They also said their lack of motivation, and they also said they like eating unhealthy food. Well, liking eating unhealthy food, well, if you've not got a functioning satiety system, if your homeostatic systems are, are not keeping your appetite in check, it's not surprising that hedonic systems are dominating, OK? So I think, unwittingly, the adolescents living with obesity are telling us a lot about struggling with their biology in an environment which promotes overconsumption, and we can understand that both from the biological side of obesity, but also the public health side of obesity as well. Did the healthcare practitioners get it? No, not really. Unhealthy eating habits, lack of exercise, preference for unhealthy foods. It's all that diet and lifestyle sort of stuff without recognising the underpinning biology of obesity. Now, in terms of actually having a discussion, and remember, many of these adolescents had not have a, had a discussion with their healthcare practitioner about their obesity. Certainly, in the UK, they hadn't, OK, because of the breakdown. We only see adolescents living with obesity when they present. We don't routinely check on them in the UK. So there's very few therapeutic interactions in the UK. But this is the overall feelings. Now, I, I would ask you to ignore positive net and negative net, because I think they're a little bit illusional. They, give, they kind of suggest that it's a bit more positive than it's negative. What I want to get you, you to get from this slide is you can feel a variety of mo motivations or, or uh, feelings, complex feelings, when you have that therapeutic conversation. So you can feel motivated, supported, hopeful and relieved, but you can also feel ashamed, depressed, confused, discouraged and blamed, all in the same therapeutic interaction, OK? It's a bit of a roller coaster. I think healthcare practitioners need a bit of training and a bit of support on this. Uh, I don't think surprised, by the way, is a positive uh, outcome of a therapeutic interaction. Surprise, you're living with obesity. I don't think that's really a positive. I think that needs to be taken out of that top bit. But what really sticks out to me here, which is what the caregivers were uh, underestimating, we don't see so much in the adult data, is the shame. The amount of shame these adolescents living with obesity feel. And again, think of the mental health consequences of that. Now, to speak to a little bit, and this is a recent analysis, I've shown you mainly descriptive statistics, we're now applying through the analysis. What did we see in terms of mental well-being and self-esteem? Well, we saw higher levels of poor mental well-being, as measured by the WHO5 score, and high levels of low self-esteem, or lower self-esteem, as measured by the Rosenberg as well. And what was this associated with? Well, it was associated with being female, being older, and having a higher obesity class unsurprisingly. But we do really think with these levels going on here that actually when you routinely 
talking to adolescents living with obesity, you need to be aware of these mental health issues, and these probably need addressing independently or directly as well. Now, in summary, what we saw was 72% of adolescents li living with obesity perceived that obesity had a strong or very strong impact on their overall health and well-being. So there is that knowledge out there. Adolescents living with obesity reported a desire to be in better shape as the main motivator, while healthcare practitioners tend to think it was around appearance and social life. But they did recognise self-esteem as an important motivator. 65% of adolescents with living with obesity assumed full responsibility for their weight loss. And I think this is really alarming. And we do really need to do something about that. Because there's a lot of kids out there struggling on their own and taking advice from YouTube. Do we really want that? And finally, adolescents living with obesity and also their caregivers reported a complex mixture of feelings after recent weight discussions with a healthcare practitioner. And I think we just need to be aware that these are very tricky conversations and you need to ask permission to discuss weight, first of all, and you need to be very non-judgmental in your discussions and you really need to be careful about your language and the assumptions that you go in with. Now, I would love to present you the UK data because everything is much worse in the UK. We have class, much higher levels of class 2 and 3 obesity in our samples, much less awareness of the consequences of living with obesity on health, and far fewer interactions between healthcare practitioners and adolescents living with obesity and their caregivers. And I hope when we get to present the UK data, it will be a bit of a clarion call to do something around access to effective obesity management in the UK, which is absolutely dreadful at the moment and I don't see it getting much better. Now rant over with, uh, thank you for your attentions. Unfortunately I won't be here for the, uh, for the panel session because I've got to uh, dash off to Heathrow but it's lovely to have this opportunity and it's lovely to weigh the banner for mental health and uh, obesity in adolescence as well. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Jason, and, and in particular for highlighting these mental health issues. Uh, we know that mental health issues are more likely to be a cause of financial insecurity, and financial insecurity is more likely uh, to then lead to, to mental health. And to see that there's this analogous relationship with obesity really does start to highlight the importance of taking into account uh, mental health, anxiety, stress, and so on, when we're thinking about how these different issues play out and, and how we address them. So thank you very much, Jason, for uh, highlighting that particular um, issue um, for us. So we're now going to hear from Professor Julia Brannan and Professor Rebecca O'Connell on living hand-to-mouth children and food in low-income families. Um, they're going to, to do a double act for us. Julia is the uh, Professor Emeritus in the Sociology of Family at the Thomas Corwin Research Institute at the UCL Institute of Education. And Rebecca is Professor of Food, Families and Society at the Centre for Research in Public Health and Community Care in the School of Health and Social Work at the University of Hertfordshire. So they're going to be talking about children's perspectives of food and eating. And I would say that if you haven't read their book on food and work, it's really fantastic and you really need to read it. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what they've got to say. Please. Many thanks to the organisers um, for inviting us to speak today. The findings that we're going to share are from a larger European study of families and food in hard times that was funded by the European Research Council. It was carried out by a team of researchers in three different countries and led by us both at the Thomas Coram Research Unit, UCL Institute of Education, um, though I've recently moved to the University of Hertfordshire. So I'm going to provide a bit of um, background and describe the study's methodology and methods before passing over to Julia, who will tell you a bit about what children said to us about their access to food, about their experiences of food poverty, and suggest some policy implications. 
So first, what do we mean by food poverty? Well, there are differences in the ways that poverty and food poverty and household food insecurity are conceptualised, defined and measured. But at the heart of any definition is a lack of access to sufficient food for health. In addition to this, most definitions recognise that, as the social anthropologist Audrey Richards puts it, food is also saturated with values or meanings um, beyond those that meet biological needs. So food is a, a fundamentally symbolic as well as a material resource. It mediates our relationships with others and it's a measure of a person's worth, as Karina was saying. So the definition of household food insecurity that's adopted by the Food and Agriculture Organisation and captured here by Liz Dowler includes this notion of having stable access to food that's both sufficient to meet health needs but also socio-cultural needs. And these different elements are, are captured in national statistics on household food insecurity, such as those gathered by the Family Resources Survey that conceptualise food insecurity as a kind of spectrum from very low food insecurity that entails an absolute lack of food to marginal food insecurity that includes worry about running out of food before there's money to buy more. Back to the Joseph Roundtree Foundation again. So in this analysis of the households below average income data set from 2019-20 by the JRF, you can see that apart from single adults, it is children who are most likely to be living in households with low or very low food insecurity, very low food security. As you've heard, the situation has worsened since then, and the latest survey by the Food Foundation finds that four million children are living in homes without adequate access to food. And this is an increase of 50% since April. When we designed our study almost 10 years ago, there was very little research on the extent of food insecurity among families or on the experiences of children and young people themselves. And we set out to address this gap. At that time, the global financial crisis, so-called austerity measures in some countries, and rising food prices were leading to national and international media reporting increasing demand for food aid, families choosing between heating and eating, and children arriving at school hungry. Sadly, we are now living in the midst of another perfect storm, and the research is just as relevant now as it was then. Our overall question was about what differences, what different social contexts and social positionings, being an adult or being a child, make to both the extent of food insecurity and the experience of food poverty. We set out to answer this question through a realist comparative case study approach. We selected the three countries, the UK, Portugal and Norway, to provide for a contrast of context in relation to conditions of austerity. We conceptualise reality as consisting of three levels, so the kind of macro level context of international and national policies, the MISO level context of the local area and schools, and the micro level of individual children and their families. And we used a mix of different types of quantitative and qualitative methods to research reality at these different layers. At the micro level, we focused on children aged 11 to 16 years and their parents, usually their mothers, in 133 families in the three countries, including 45 families in the UK and 51 children. And you can find more about the international research here in the book. In the UK, two thirds of our families lived in inner London, while a third lived in a coastal town. These were both areas of social deprivation and they were similar in some ways and different in others. And these contexts shaped families' access to affordable, nutritious food and children's opportunities for socialising. All the children and parents that we recruited were living in families who had incomes below what they needed. So these included low-paid working families, low mothers who were reliant on benefits 
and there were a handful of families who had no recourse to public funds because of their legal migration status. We carried out individual visits to children and to parents at home where possible, and we aimed to interview children separately from their parents, although that wasn't always possible due to a lack of space at home. The methods included um, semi-structured interviews and self-completion questionnaires, and we also used um, visual vignettes or visual scenarios to ask about some topics where this was appropriate. And a subsample of the children also took part in visual methods, so we gave them cameras and they took photographs for us of their everyday lives and food and eating and then discussed them with us afterwards. So we know that quality and quantity of food affects children both in the present and in the long term, especially their health. We know that quality, um, and that given that children eat in a number of different contexts, we were really interested in the foods that were available to them across these different sites. So Julia is going to take over now. First, she's going to share evidence on these different contexts in which the children eat, and then she'll describe how the children experience and act in and on those contexts to manage food poverty. So, first of all, food at, at home and what we learned from the children. A quarter said that at some point um, or at some time they had felt hungry because of lack of food. Others were protected from hunger by their parents because they reduced their food intake or skip meals. And parents managed to feed their children, they told us, in the following ways. They bulked out the more affordable, nutritious food with carbohydrates. They shopped for value foods, deals. They limited the amount of fruit they bought. And they didn't invite children or allow their children to have their friends home for tea or for snacks. So Gideon, his family, was, had no recourse to public funds because uh, of their migrant status. And he told us, yeah, we used to eat like... But now we haven't eaten because my mum stopped working. Not enough food coming. We have to cope with it and not spend nothing. Because, like, if you do, then you're going to struggle more. Despite being on low incomes, um, on, in terms of eating um, at school, only half of the children in our study were entitled uh, to a free school meal. This is in UK. A few because their families had no recourse to public funds, but most for income level reasons and the entitlement. Some, but not all the schools, provided children with a meal from their own budgets. And the children told us that the free school meals allowance was not sufficient for their appetites and several mentioned being restricted to smaller items. So Murad, who's 12, he said, the bigger sandwiches I can't have, the smaller ones I can. But like the sandwich boxes, the triangle sandwich boxes, one's black and one's brown, and I'm allowed the brown one, not the black one, and the cheesecakes, and there's a smaller version, the bigger version, and if you're on free not on free school meals, you get to have the bigger version. And if you are, you have the smaller version. And children also eat or outside the home with their friends, often after school, and taking part in social activities that are, tend to be organised around eating, are ways that young people learn to make sense of their place in the world and how to build relationships. And in our study, almost a third had no money to spend outside school, and variation of, depending on age, of course. But the older children, the older young people, felt excluded from their friendship groups, particularly. 
Those who lived in the coastal town were often far from the town centre and the places where young people tend to hang out. While those in the inner part of London that we studied um, talked about the uh, expensive cafes that had sprung up in the gentrifying high street. Charlie said, my friends like buy paninis and stuff from the cafes for like three and four pounds. I don't, just don't have that money. Amara said, when I go with my friends, for example, Starbucks or Cafe Nero, why would I spend eight pounds on a coffee and a cake when I could get like proper food? like food that can actually last me for a couple of days. There's no point. I think it's important to stress that children are not only victims of food poverty. They're also agents who manage their daily lives and, and get by. Some mentioned, uh, and, and they, they, they manage in different ways. Of course, so many of them felt ashamed and different. Maddie, 16 year old, explains how some of her friends refused to eat the value foods that they have at home. And she also said people look down on people on benefits as her family is, is living on benefits. Some talked about st being stigmatized. At, at school, how the canteen system and the staff shamed them publicly by making them stick to the smaller, low-cost items, as Murat told us. Faith said, the lunchtime supervisor was like, you can't get that, you're on free school meals. Like I was really embarrassed, because people were waiting behind me. I was kind of like, oh my God. Some young people concealed food poverty from their friends by making excuses for not taking part in activities. Shola told us, I have a friend that does that. They might fake a story about not going out and people believe it because obviously they don't know. Like, you wouldn't really suspect who's like you and who's not because people are just trying to fit in and not get picked on for the way they live or the way their lifestyle is. Some young people outrightly rejected poverty, food poverty, or being poor. Jordan told us that his friends are no different from him. Like, they may not be like poor poor, but they are like struggling with the hard times. Because we're not poor, poor, but we're not totally licked like for money either. Like we're just struggling along, like the rest of them, like everyone else. Some, or a few young people really, stressed the importance of staying positive. Phoebe said um, her, her father had a middle class job and he'd lost it two years before and she said, well, we're not at a point right we're not going to be able to eat. We're just like, okay, we can't do these activities this week. It'll be fine. Some young people normalized feeling hungry, and their parents told us that they struggled to feed the, the bigger appetites of growing children. Jimmy, 14-year-old, worries about money sometimes and occasionally goes to bed feeling hungry. He said... I, I, started, I just started to grow like. And, and when I started to grow, I think my belly started to grow as well. And poverty also made some children um, feel that they had to grow up too fast. Shola again, she said, you've got to learn to be careful. It's like you've got to grow up a bit too fast. You've got to learn to keep yourself to yourself. Some children were very proactive in helping their parents manage food poverty by not asking for things that cost money or going out to the, going to the supermarket and searching out bargains um, 
in the supermarket at the end of the day. Some resisted the idea that um, some children were more advantaged than others. And two girls were especially eloquent. Amara said, we're all human beings and we should all be the same. Faith said, like, I think everyone should be classified as equal. So you shouldn't feel as if you're out of place and that the food you eat should be the same food that they eat. So what does our research have to say for, to policy makers? And I think it speaks to what Ruth uh, talked about in terms of children's capabilities, that they should have the right to a decent standard of living with a family income that can provide adequate nutritious food, that they should have the right to an adequate nutritious meal at school in the same way that children have the right to education, and that they should have the right to socialize with friends at home and in their neighborhoods, and that these homes and houses and Places outside should be healthier places for young people. And we look forward to hearing more on the next, uh, from the next speaker on this. Thank you very much.